वेलकम टू पार्टी स्ट्री Today we are going to discuss about the decline of the Mauryan Empire. The Mauryan Empire declined within 50 years after the death of Ashoka. Some scholars argued that Ashokan policies were responsible for the downfall of the empire. But there are some differences in their point of view. On the other hand some scholars suggested that not Ashoka but economic backwardness administrative weakness were responsible for that to trace the actual cause we should critically discuss all the views of the scholars Mahamahopadhyay Haraprasad Shastri in an essay published in the Journal of the Asiatic Society of Bengal in 1910 argued that Ashokan policy was directly responsible for the decline of the Mauryan Empire. The revolt of Pushyamitra was a result of the Brahmanical reaction against the pro-Buddhist policy of Ashoka and the pro-Jaina policy of his successors. Shastri maintains that the ban on animal sacrifices was a direct attack on the Brahmans since much of their power and prestige lay in the fact that they alone could perform sacrifices and thus act as intermediaries between the people and the gods. A second point on the same subject is the statement that this action was particularly resented by the Brahmans since it was promulgated by a Shudra king. The Shudra origin of the Mauryas is based on a statement in Puranas when it is said that all kings succeeding Mahapadma will be of Shudra origin. A further argument of Shastri is based on the phrase from the minor rock edict at Brahmagiri referring to the gods in Jambudvipa. The original passage is like this. Ya e imaya kalaya Jambudvipa si amisa deva husu te doni mi sakata. Shastri following the interpretation of E. Senard interprets it as meaning that the Brahmans who were regarded as Bhudevas or gods on earth had been exposed by Ashoka as being false gods. According to Shastri, the Dhamma Mahamattas also destroyed the prestige of the Brahmans. The question of Vyavahar Samata and Dhanda Samata The uniformity of legal procedure and punishment is raised by Shastri in support of this argument that privileges usually given to Brahmans regarding penalties were stopped as a result of these two measures adopted by Ashoka. Recently, D.C. Ahir supported the view of Haraprasad Shastri. H.C. Ray Chaudhuri, in his famous work, Political history of ancient India opposed the view of Haraprasad Shastri. He states that the ban on animal sacrifices did not necessarily imply hostility toward the Brahmans since Brahmanical literature like Chandogya Upanishad itself stresses ahimsa and mentions the futility of laying great store on sacrifices alone. In contradiction to the theory of Shudra origin of the Mauryas, Rechaudhari points out that Puranas can only refer to the Nanda kings who succeeded Mahapadma because if it referred to succeeding dynasties, then even the Shungas and Kanvas would have to be included as Shudras. Rechaudhari also tried to prove the Kshatriya origin of the Mauryas from a later text, Divya Vadana. Following the interpretation of Silva Levi, he also gave an alternative interpretation of the passage stated before. This argument is based on an alternative route for Amisa. 
The phrase refers to the gods mixing on earth with the people and does not refer to false gods. About the act by Dhamma Mahamattas, Rechodhuri points out, this could hardly have been so since some of them were concerned specifically with safeguarding the rights and welfare of the Brahmanas. Rechodhuri refutes the argument of Shastri about Vavahar Samata and Danda Samata on the basis of the term's meaning, a uniformity of law and punishment. He suggested from some evidence like Arthashastra, Panchabingsha Brahmana, Vitereo Brahmana, etc., that the Brahmanas also were punished equally for their guilt. Romila Thapar also supported his view. Shastri finally maintains that Ashoka was strong enough to hold his own against the Brahmanas, but on his death, a conflict arose between his successors and the Brahmanas, which lasted until the assumption of power by Pushyamitra, and the latter was the expression of a great Brahmana revolution. But Rechodhuri has shown Jaloka, one of the successors of Ashoka, is described in Rajatarangani as an ardent Shaiva. Romila Thapar suggests that Pushyamitra was not violently anti-Buddhist. With the declining influence of Buddhism at the imperial court, Buddhist monuments and institutions would naturally receive less royal attention. Since the Mauryan Empire had shrunk considerably and the kings of the latter period were hardly in a position to defend themselves, it did not need a revolution to depose Brihadratha. Thapar argued that if it had been a great Brahmanical revolution, Pushyamitra would have had the assistance of other neighboring kings. Then Rechodhuri has attacked Ashoka on the basis of his having pursued a policy of non-violence or Dhammaghosha with such vigor and determination that it resulted in a completely effete nation from a military point of view and one that was not therefore able to withstand the Greek invasion. The policy of non-violence also led to a lack of control on the part of the king so that the officials became oppressive in the provinces leading to the revolts referred to in literatures like Divya Vadana. It has been stated by Rechodhuri on the basis of two stories in the text regarding the revolt of the people of Takshila that the provincial governments were oppressive but Thapar argued that there is not the least hint of an emperor who is not in control of the administration. The unconventional nature of the government did not lie in his taking to heart the doctrine of Ahimsa. It lay in the fact that he was personally convinced that a greater degree of non-violence and mutual respect would be to the benefit of the society. Had he indeed been so complete a pacifist as Raichodhuri would have us believe, he would surely have abolished the death penalty. But capital punishment continued throughout his reign. Raichodhuri maintains that the successors of Ashoka were brought up on pacifist diet to such an extent that they were incapable of standing up to any armed force and had heard more of Dhamma Ghosha than of Vedic Ghosha. But there is no hint of such an order for the demobilization of all armies and settle down to a rule of non-violence in the edicts. Ashoka was in a position to maintain pacific policies because his frontiers were secure and was the territory within the empire. The absence of innumerable conquests does not in any way suggest that Ashoka merely wished to retain what his father and grandfather had conquered before him. D. D. Kosambi, in his book An Introduction to the Study of Indian History, 
has expressed the opinion that there was a considerable pressure on economy under that latter Mauryas. This argument is based on two factors. Primarily, unnecessary measures were employed to increase the tax, example tax on actors and prostitutes mentioned in the Arthashastra. Secondly, the Mauryan punch-marked coins of this period show evidence of debasement. Dn Jha also pointed out it in his book Ancient India, an introductory outline. But according to Romila Thapar, this view is largely the result of an analysis based on selected economic evidence without taking into consideration the political factors of the time. It was during the Mauryan period that for the first time the importance of taxation as a primary source of national income was fully appreciated. This resulted in a tendency to tax everything that could possibly be taxed. It is clear from the Arthashastra that such taxes are not an emergency measure and these were as normal as that received from the cultivators. Debasement of coinage during the Mauryan period did not necessarily mean a pressure on the general economy. It is possible that debased money began to circulate particularly in the areas which were gradually ceding from the empire. In these areas the coins may have been punched by the authorities and put into circulation without properly ascertaining their quality. Furthermore, such debasement may also indicate that there was an increased demand for silver in relation to other goods and therefore the silver content in coins was dropped. According to Thapar, Kosambi's argument is based on his own identification of the coins of the latter Mauryas and this is by no means certain. Evidence from other material remains does not suggest a pressure on the economy. If anything, the picture is that of an expanding economy. Thapar argues that it is possible during the period of extreme political confusion, particularly in the Ganges Valley, there may have been some hoarding of money by the merchants and commercial classes. This hoarding may well have led to a debasement of coinage, but there is no doubt of the economic prosperity that prevailed with the political decline of the Mauryan Empire. But later Thapar partly departed from this view and agreed that the big structure of bureaucracy and the expense of Dhammaghosha created a pressure on the economy. Niharanjan Ray, in his essay named Maurya and Sunga Art, argued that Ushamitra's revolt was actually a people's revolt against Mauryan oppression and a rejection of the Mauryan adoption of foreign ideas, as for instance in Mauryan art. The idea of popular revolt is further elaborated on the basis of Ashoka having banned the festive meetings and his discouragement of the eating of meat. It perhaps antagonized the population, though Thapar argues it is still open to question whether these prohibitions were strictly enforced. It is also unlikely that there was a sufficient national consciousness among the varied peoples of the empire to rise up against Mauryan oppression even if this existed. Another argument that has been used on occasion in favor of the idea of a revolt against the Mauryas is that the land tax under the Mauryas is described in Greek sources as being one quarter and this high taxation is too heavy a burden on the cultivator. But Romila Thapar argued that the tax varied from region to region according to the fertility of the soil and the availability of the water. It is unlikely that the Mauryas would have insisted on such high taxation in normal conditions. 
Finally, Romila Thapar argues that the decline of the Mauryan Empire cannot be satisfactorily explained by quoting military inactivity, Brahman resentment, popular uprisings, or economic pressure. So, Thapar is more concerned with the administrative structure of the empire. Mauryan bureaucracy, had it been of a different nature, might still have saved the situation and prevented such a complete disintegration of the empire. The administration was of an extremely centralized character with the higher functions as far as possible under the direct control of the ruler. This in itself necessitated a king of considerable personal ability. In such a situation, the weakening of the central control leads automatically to a weakening of the administration. With the death of Ashoka and the uneven quality of his successors, there was a weakening at the center, particularly after the division of the empire. The breaking away of the provinces was at this point almost inevitable. Since the officials of the administration owed their loyalty to the king and not to the state, they became the personal employees of the king particularly as the king had such overwhelming powers of personal selection. This meant that a change of king could result in a change of officials, at least of the more senior and responsible ones. Even with this fact of changing loyalties, the Mauryas could have employed a system to ensure the contribution of a well-trained bureaucracy which would maintain the pace of administration through many political upheavals. Although the Arthashastra goes into such considerable detail regarding the administration of the kingdom, yet now here is there an indication of how the subordinate administrators were recruited. The high officials were selected on the personal choice of the king. Thapar presumed that this system of personal selection continued down the scale. This strengthened the force of social kinship since there would be a natural tendency for officers to select subordinates from members of their own social group or friends. This would in turn create either group loyalties or group antagonisms towards the new kings. Should one official have to be dismissed for disloyalty to the new king, possibly an entire section of the administration would have to be changed. No doubt the latter Mauryan kings must have frequently faced this situation. With a weak king at the center, it was not difficult for a local ruler or prince to direct loyalty towards himself instead of the king. Other factors of importance contributing to this disintegration and the lack of national unity were the ownership of land and the inequality of economic levels. It is apparent that the population of the subcontinent was not at a uniform level of cultural development either. The more sophisticated cities and the trade centers were a great contrast to the isolated village communities. The study of Indian history has suffered in the past from some historians who have assumed that the pattern of the Magadha through the centuries has been valid for the entire subcontinent. The causes of the decline of the Mauryas must in large part be attributed to a tough heavy administration where authority was entirely in the hands of a few persons and an absence of any national consciousness. So we can conclude that neither a single cause nor Ashokan policies were responsible for the downfall of the Mauryan Empire. This is the end of our today's discussion. Please subscribe our channel, like our videos and comment. Listen to our podcast episodes. Follow our official Facebook page, 
Twitter handle and Instagram. For an inquiry, feel free to mail us. For details, see the description.